All right, everybody. How is everybody today? Good morning. Hope everyone's well out there and had a wonderful holiday weekend. Um, relaxing and hopefully got some stuff done. <laughs> Um, so a couple quick updates before we start today. The first one tomorrow, we start off our Coral, we Coral Reefs week. We've got Christina Cortez coming, who's the one of the founders of Coral Hero. She's going to be taking us on a little adventure through uh, designing coral conservation programs in uh, Mexico. Then on the next day, we have Ellen, our own Dive Ninjas team member. She's going to be doing an intro to Coral Reefs. And then for those interested too, on Saturday, we've got something different. We're also offering an online course, um, the Project Aware specialty to, for coral conservation. Um, so we've got a couple cool things uh, coming up this week, plus a lot more great talks. We'll actually be releasing this afternoon, um, the full schedule for the next two weeks. If you haven't seen it already, it'll be on Facebook and uh, Instagram later today. So make sure to uh, check us out on there. Uh, Max, how are you doing today, buddy? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me here, Jay. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. So today, guys, we've got something really different I'm really excited for. Uh, Maxwell's going to be taking us on a, little, a bit of a exploration and kind of cool stuff off the grid out in uh, British Columbia and everything like that. If you don't know who he is, he's a contributing videographer for BBC and National Geographic. Um, so without further ado, I hand it over to you, brother. How are you today? Um, I'm doing great. Thanks, Jay. I mean, it's... Um, a little bit of dark times right now with this whole pandemic, but you know, hopefully we can shed some light on the world with these uh, live stories. And you know, maybe in the next couple of weeks, everything will get back to normal and get back to doing what we love and back in the ocean and exploring. Sounds great, man. Well, I'll hand it over to you. Feel free to share your screen when you're ready and uh, I'll let awesome. you take over. Thanks, Jay. All right, guys. So I'm gonna pull up my, my screen here. It's um. It's on a subject that I'm truly passionate a bit about, and it's um, diving off the grid. So this is, you know, diving in places that people don't normally go. Um, I've been pretty fortunate to have been diving like all over the world. I, I worked as a recreational instructor for, for many years, and I got to travel and see many exotic locations and countries. And, and now I've been, you know, exploring my own backyard in, in Canada. And um, yeah, so... I'll give you a bit of background about me. I, uh, I've been in the diving industry as a professional since 2005. Um, originally, I was gonna go to film school and I wanted to be a, you know, a videographer. It had nothing to do with underwater at, at this point. But, so I, I signed up for college. I, I got accepted to this, this good, good facility and I was gonna become a videographer, but I had about three months to kill before the program started. So I, I decided to do a trip to Honduras and, and do a bit of backpacking. And um, anyway, I got to Honduras and I started backpacking and I, I went out to the Bay Islands and took my open water course and I just, I fell in love with diving. I became like totally hooked to the lifestyle and, and um, I decided to put off school for, for the next while and, and just become a, a paddy recreational diver. And for, for eight years, I got to, to travel and explore and see pretty cool parts of the world. I, I worked in you know, Honduras, Vietnam, Norway, Greece, Turks and Caicos, Bahamas, Zanzibar and Tanzania. And I, I just loved it. And when I started, you know, Facebook and Instagram weren't really uh, popular at that point. I don't think they're even around in 2005. So I just had a compact camera and I would take pictures and email my friends and family at home and show them some of the cool experiences. And as I, my travels progressed, so did my cameras. And I, um, I started, um, I started, uh, you know, getting a little bit better at my hobby and, and progressing in skills. And I also, I wanted to progress in, and also the, my diving knowledge. So I, I learned how to become a technical diver and uh, became a uh, tech instructor and started teaching for a bit. And I just got, you know, hooked to this, you know, working underwater kind of complicated technical type of diving. So I, I decided that commercial diving would be a really good route for me. And, um, became a commercial diver in, in Canada and started working all over the country and doing, you know, underwater construction, um, seafood harvesting, environmental surveys, welding. And then I got to this point where I could actually teach commercial diving. And so I, I spent a, a few years teaching at a local school here on the island called Dive Safe International and, and taught students for inshore and offshore diving and how to use all these crazy tools underwater. But what commercial diving allowed me to do was to, to make a, good income for myself and as you know um, dive gear isn't isn't um, isn't cheap especially underwater camera gear so 
I use uh, my my trade and commercial diving to to kind of purchase all my stuff for for underwater videography and and diving. And I just kind of I went in deep. I, I kind of put that commercial diving on hold and just really took took a passion to to underwater photography and underwater videography. And with the help of social media, I started building up my my clients and my network. And and I got asked to do lots of um, stock video for for different documentaries. I licensed video to BBC and Nat Geo and and I've got some pretty exciting products coming up here in the, the next couple of months. If if everything goes to plan, hopefully the world will get back to normal. We'll, we'll see. And anyway, the the diving in Canada is is absolutely phenomenal, but not many people are aware of that. And especially in the winter months, um, the visibility here is 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 very clear. We've got like 50 feet vis and it's it's just gorgeous but during the summer i was noticing that the the ocean uh you know is, is pretty the visibility wasn't very good that we had lots of algae and plankton blooms so i started looking inwards into the the lakes and the the, the rivers and the canyons and stuff like that and uh, this is actually an image from um, a local river just up the road and it's in about two feet of water. It's all muddy substrate. It doesn't really look appealing from the surface. And actually my fiance was like, why are you taking a photo there? Like, it doesn't really look like a great spot, but I kind of played around with the, you know, shooting upwards and using the fisheye effect and it turned out to be a really cool image. Like it's, uh, it's, it's very unique compared to a lot of uh, underwater images you see. And I, I started to fall in love with like um, getting into these unique spots and capturing different perspectives that people don't normally see and uh, not your like typical reef shark or manta ray or something like that so I I wanted to you know get out there and really explore and I, I started diving into the canyons and chasing the light you know I really love finding uh, light peering through the treetops and down in the rivers and I go up logging roads and explore and use google maps to, to help me find different locations and I have a drone with me to, to help find different different river pools I could dive into and of course the the visibility in the river isn't always like crystal clear like it is in these images you kind of got to wait like three weeks or so before with no heavy rains and you'll get the nice clear vis but it, it just turned into this really cool spot to do a lot of um, landscape type photography but underwater and it it, it, it really inspired me to to do more and um, you know, start bringing my friends and, and family and, and using them as models to, to, to help me with uh, these underwater shots. And I just, I just love the, the, you know, the texture and the colors and, and everything about the, the river diving. It's just, you get this emerald green that you, you don't normally see in the ocean. Typically when you, you see underwater photographers work, it's all like bright blue backgrounds. In these rivers and, and lakes, they're, um, you get this really emerald green type color, and I, I like it. I don't, I don't edit that out. I, I like to keep it as, as is or enhance it if possible, and you know, really chase, chase these, these rays and look for really cool spots to, to get unique perspectives. And just diving with my buddy here, uh, Ryan Miller. Um, the best thing about diving with another photographer is you kind of use each other as, as models from, from time to time, and it gives a unique perspective to you know having a person in the image just kind of shows you the scale of, of where you're at you're at this is a, a pretty cool canyon uh, just up island and it's 60 feet above there's a there's a bridge and it's it just turned into this gorgeous scene with the sunburst and I've, I've, I've really just you know I love it I can just use ambient lighting don't have to bring strobes or lights with me and create these really cool cool dramatic landscapes this is a a shot from um up north it's um off a logging road you kind of had to take a machete to to get down and, and and carve your way into the river here uh, but it's a 60 foot canyon and it, um from from down below looking up it almost looks like a, a castle with its formations it's just you know thousands of years of water flowing through this this canyon has carved up the limestone to, to really give it a really cool dramatic feel and having like a, a model like a, my friend here crystal jenicky in the background with a with a light you know really sent adds a, a sense of adventure to, to the image and really makes it a you know pretty cool cool story here's another one with my buddy russell clark and you know down in this canyon we're uh, we're sitting there doing photography and then all of a sudden we get like this school of a uh, hundred salmon swim by 
and they start going up river to spawn. It's pretty wild. And there's Steve Woods and Michelle and another local spots and you know that just the, the the textures you get like the the rock formations are just so cool it's nothing nothing you'd see in the the ocean like this and then occasionally you get the big big logs that come down the river and get get wedged in the cracks and crevices and stuff and you know uh, steve woods is one of my good buddies and he's uh he does lots of photos and some of his stuff's gone into national geographic and whatnot and you know we just take turns putting down our cameras and, and getting shots for each other and lining up, you know, chasing the light and finding cool, cool perspectives and really getting that nice emerald color to create a, a really dramatic, dramatic scene. Here's another one with uh, my buddy, William Drum. Uh, it's kind of hiding in the, in the shadows and letting the sun kind of pierce over top of the, the river bank. And Steve Woods, we uh, decided to, you know, take off his spins and get him to, to run along the bottom. And there was a bridge above us that looked really cool. It's like almost like a, um, I don't know, a scene from Star Wars or something like that. The light's almost like his, his lightsaber. And, you know, I put this up online and it immediately became like a, a meme and went all over the world and just got completely viral. And just from, you know, simply just taking off his spins and running along the bottom for some, for some images, it, it turned out pretty cool. But you know, pretty pretty unique compared to any kind of ocean dives I've ever done. And the thing I like about diving in the rivers is you always get a little bit of flow. Like there's there's never like no flow, but the flow kind of helps like push your bubbles away and push the backscatter out of the image. So that's how I was able to to get you know the shot of him without any bubbles above him, and it looked pretty pretty wild. And then it kind of came into the you know shooting salmon. Salmon are are amazing creatures they're they're we you know we're pretty lucky here in Canada to have so many species and you know the, the rivers are pretty pretty healthy in some of the areas here and when I first started seeing salmon underwater it, it was pretty tricky to to start to shoot them because they're so skittish they uh, as soon as you you show presence in the water they just vanish so I had to spend lots of time you know getting this letting the salmon get used to me and, and figuring out different ways that I could, um, you know, get in the water and be able to get images of them. And for this particular shot, it was about 40 feet in a canyon. And I used the shadows of the, of the edge here just to kind of hide in, hold my breath for a few minutes and, and let the salmon kind of pass and get a really cool shot. You usually get like one or two shots if you're using strobes because the strobes tend to scare them. But for this stuff, I was just using ambient lighting and it, it let me, you know, get off about 10 shots off before I had to get back up to the surface. Here's a kind of a cool video clip to give you uh, kind of my, my perspective under the water. So you get thousands, th tens of thousands of, of pink coho chinook, uh, depending on the time of the year and the species, you'll you just get these, these pools of salmon. And for this video, I, I actually wasn't underwater uh, shooting this. I, I watched the salmon and to kind of see their, their behavior and what their kind of their roots were underwater. And so what I did is I, I went down and I uh, put my camera on a tripod and let the camera, I let the fish get used to the, the camera. So if you put the camera in the water for a couple of hours, they, they get used to it and they don't get scared. I think the reflection in the dome kind of spooks them. So if you put it in the water, you let them get used to it, and then they get comfortable. And so I set it up and used the, the ambient lighting. It, it worked out really well. And here's another sh shot from um, from down below, looking upwards. These clips are. I've been contacted so much by different documentaries wanting to, to use them because they're just they're so unique and it's it's in a wild environment. It's not a not a cage or a pen or anything like that. And you're getting all these different species of, of salmon just gracefully uh, swimming up the river to, to spawn. Makes a, a pretty good back uh, backdrop or a desktop display for or a background on your computer too. And you just get, you know, 
tens of thousands pulling in. Uh, these kind of shots are, are pretty tricky to get. You really got to hide and wait for the perfect moment to, 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 to get a picture of the salmon because they're, with this as using a flash, so you get one, one picture and then they're, they're, they're gone, but it's well worth it. Here's another really cool perspective, a vertical shot and up above, probably from the bottom of the river to the top is 100 feet to that bridge. And if you could, I could see people walking along the bridge and, and taking pictures down below and it was just like gin clear looking down into the, into the river and you get these, these thousands of salmon all pulling up in here. It's, it's pretty wild. This is one of my, my favorite uh, salmon shots. Just they all lined up perfectly and it, it worked out so well. They're just such, you know, beautiful fish. And they, it's pretty cool that, you know, they, they can uh, live both in fresh water and salt water. And wherever they, they were born and uh, they come back to spawn. And ultimately, they, you know, when they spawn, they, they die and their the cycle goes on. But the amount of nutrients and, um, you know, the food that these salmon provide for, for so many other species is, is pretty amazing. You know, even when they, they, they rot in the river, those nutrients go into the trees and the moss and into the bugs and birds and the bears. And it's just such a, they're such a keystone species for, for, for like the environment. This shot, um, I had to spend about three hours in the river. Um, Typically in Canada, I wear a dry suit just because it's it's so cold. Uh, the water temperature ranges from eight degrees Celsius to twelve degrees, kind of depending on the the time of the year. And that's that's the ocean temperature. Um, in the rivers in the summer, it's maybe twelve to fourteen degrees Celsius. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit. Sorry for for the Americans, um, but it's, it's cold. It's really cold. So as as in the river bank, just my, my feet were actually, you know, sticking onto the edge and just my body and my, my camera were in the water with a snorkel. And I had to wait there for like three hours to, for the salmon to get comfortable with me and to start, you know, swimming closer and closer and closer because I was shooting with a fish eye. So in order to get a shot like this, this the salmon really have to be fairly close, like six inches or so. So look, at, it took a lot of time, um, but it, it was well worth it. And then, you know, it's, it's such a unique thing to see, you know, compared to a lot of stuff that you'd see out in the ocean. And when I took this shot, I, again, I was in the water for quite a while and I, uh, had, I, I must have had my head on the water for at least an hour. And I pulled up my head and just as I looked out from the water, there was a bear right across from me with his head in the water. And it looked up and it had a big fish in its mouth. And, you can see its eyes were wide, wide and mine were probably, you know, super wide. And I, you know, slowly went down to get my camera and I was going to line up this perfect split shot, but the bear ran off and I didn't get the shot, but that would have been pretty cool. You know, he's probably like just 10 feet away from me fishing for salmon. Once they're comfortable with you, they they, they don't mind the, the camera and the lights. And, you know, they just, they just do their thing. And, you know, you got to respect them and not spook them from their, their environment. But when they're busy trying to get upriver to, to spawn and get to this, their different birth birth places to, to release their eggs, they're, they're pretty preoccupied. And so the, the rivers led me to the lakes and the, the ponds and the swamps. And I started scouting around looking for, for unique places to take photos. And this was one that a uh, lake I found up, up north and I just saw a bunch of uh, lily pads from the surface and it looked you know, pretty beautiful. And I got my, into my wetsuit and got in the water, got my camera ready. And I started swimming out to these, these lily pads, these water lilies. And first thing I noticed was uh, leeches. There was these like six to seven inch long leeches and they're huge. I've, I've never seen them under underwater before. And, you know, I, it's such a beautiful spot, but there are leeches everywhere. And, you know, most people are pretty freaked out by those. And uh, eventually I got used to them and I, I knew that, you know, wearing a, a wetsuit with boots and gloves and stuff on like that, I'd be, I'd be pretty safe. Just pretty much this, this section of my face is exposed and nothing else. So. I'm pretty sure they can't get me through through neoprene, but who knows? 
but yeah, so I, I started falling in love with like these underwater plants, like these um, little canopies of, of lily pads were just absolutely stunning and made for like a really cool, unique kind of view. It's almost like a little uh, fairy world or hidden kingdom or something like that with them. It's just, it's just tranquil and, and, and so, you know, peaceful and, and different than something that you can normally see out in the ocean. And I started noticing, um, like it looks like little trails that are underwater, but the spacing is actually only a, a six inch gap. And it's, it's just the fisheye effect making this environment look like uh, a giant, giant environment, but really it's, it's quite small. And it, it's just, it's so beautiful and different than most things I've seen. And I started noticing all these little tadpoles swimming by and I, I um, was watching them and they're just kind of usually conjugated in these lines of, of, of hundreds and then it turned into thousands. And I went deeper in the water and I, I found, you know, there's probably hundreds of thousands of these, these Western toad tadpoles, they're all kind of in the mud, but starting to make their way towards the, the lily pads. And I was uh, pretty intrigued. Like, it's just nothing I've ever seen before. And they're completely fearless. They, they didn't, didn't mind me in the water. And they're, uh, you know, just slowly swimming along. Coming around and I just kind of started following them into the into the shallows to, to see where they're going and what, what they're up to. And, you know, they're landing on me, landing on the camera, landing on my, my, my mask and stuff. And just such cool little, little critters. So I, I, uh, I spent more time at the lake and, and, and to kind of see what's, what's, what are these tadpoles doing? Like I, I didn't really understand. And then I learned that they do a daily migration. So during the evening, say they, they kind of sit in the, in the mud. I think it keeps them kind of warm. And then during uh, the day when the, the sun comes up, they all start heading towards the shallows and the, the warmer sections of the, of the lake. And I think that's where they, they eat like the microplants and algaes. And it's probably something to do with oxygen in the shallow water. So each morning they'd all in tens by tens of thousands, they'd all make their way towards the, the um, lake's edge. And then during the evening, just before the sun went down, they'd all come back towards the, the muddy substrate. And, and I think they did spend the night there, but it's, it's almost like uh, one of those fish spas that you'd, you'd see in, um, in Asia, the, the temple just, you know, land on your hand and they, they kind of just gum you. It doesn't hurt or anything like that. They're actually herbivores at this stage. And then later on when they go through their metamorphosis, they're, they, they, they eat bugs and, and things like that. But they're pretty cool that I would, you know, I kind of fell in love with, with the tadpoles. I wanted to learn more and I, I'd go back and they start off as um, their eggs look like little, little black pearls and the eggs only, they don't, they hatch after three to 12 days, depending on the water temperature. And once they, they hatch, they, you know, go through this really amazing um, stage of metamorphosis and, and you, you see them that they're just kind of like little black gumballs swimming at first. And then they start, you know, growing and developing features, their eyes and their mouths. And, you start seeing their, their hands afterwards and the metamorphosis is about six to, to eight weeks long, kind of depending on location. And so you get about four weeks of uh, really good uh, action going on in, in some of the local lakes around here. But it's just such a cool scene and, you know, all these allergies and, and despite that, the leeches that are in there, it's, it's just, it's pretty wild. Makes for, for very good photography and, and videography. This was one of my, one of, I first encountered um, the tadpoles on my, my first clips and I was just completely blown away. You can see lots are in like different stages of their metamorphosis depending on when they, they hatch. Some got their legs out, some are kind of looking more like frog-like. careful with them, um, you know, not damaging the, the, their environment. So I usually don't use lights or strobes or anything like that, just ambient lighting and 
I usually put on a fish eye just so that my, my system's really compact and I can navigate through the, the water lilies with ease without disturbing any of their habitat or anything like that. And I just, you know, spend a lot of time snorkeling in the lake and just watching them and set up little spots where I can record them as they go by. And it just kind of, you know, blew a lot of people's minds to, to see this, this. A lot of the clips and the, the photos I put online really went viral and people were sharing them, asking me questions and asking me where, I, where they can do it. And then I never post my locations just because I, you know, I want to keep these environments intact. Um, and to protect you know the critters and stuff like that but i mean there's there's these kind of spots are all over the world you know you just got to go into your your backyard and you know look in the rivers and the creeks and and then find some unique perspectives and this one i really liked um especially i have a video clip of this but i i, I can't share um just because i'm licensing it but the video clip actually shows um the tadpoles getting right up to the dome of the camera and you can actually see their little hands inside their bodies just uh, from the ambient light rays piercing through the, the water it's it's really cool and they've almost like got this like glittery color to them pretty neat little creatures and it's like you, you get this really cool uh grassy bottom in some of the, the the spots of the of the lake here and it just makes for for you know such a cool cool perspective i'm looking up a lot of these images i've I've submitted to magazines and, and things like that, sold them for, for various outlets. And it's, yeah, it's been, it's been great. I, I loved it, but it's, um, it's not always fresh water that you're, you know, you can find unique perspectives. It's also the ocean. And what I do a lot is I just travel along the coast of British Columbia and we're pretty fortunate here to have, you know, 25,000 kilometers of, of coastline. And, there's so many unique spots that you can go and, and stick your camera and, and dive. And, you know, right, right here, this is only uh, three or four feet of, of water. Just, just like went off into the, for a shore dive and, you know, you get these magical little, little kelp for us. And this is, this is down about six feet and it just looks like such a crazy environment. You got this really cool sea lettuce on the, on the bottom floor and then this bull kelp and all these little, little tube, tube fish in the, in the shallows and, um, yeah, I, I mean, finding unique spots like this is just, it's just breathtaking. And, you know, the kelp is just, it's so beautiful on its, on its own. Like you, you don't, you don't need much more aquatic life, just kelp and I'd be happy. And then some of our sites, uh, when we go diving, like up in Discovery Passage, I mean, they're, they're these are well-known dive sites, but I thought I'd throw these in there just to show you how, you know, awesome British Columbia and, and Canada is for diving. And, you know, you get, you get this crazy vibrance of, of color and an ex explosion of life. And these are all tube dwelling uh, worms. And the, the tube dwellers are like about nine to 12 inches long. They're, they're massive. It's, it's almost like you've, you've stepped into like Jurassic Park where everything's like just big, vibrant and, and prehistoric looking. And you get all the little tiny anemones growing on the, on the tube worms. And it's just something that you you wouldn't really see in the Caribbean. You know, I've been diving like kind of all over in the tropics and I see lots of colorful coral reefs and whatnot, but I tell you like Canada and British Columbia, the colors that are underwater here are far, far brighter than anything I've seen in the Caribbean. And we've got corals and, and things like that too. This was um, a site I found a few years ago. Um, so they built this big cruise ship terminal uh, on the island and it got built uh, incorrectly and it just went unused for about um, the last 10 years now. So I decided to go there and dive because there's no boats, no traffic or anything like that, but it's in a spot where there's just a crazy amount of current. So people kind of, you know, stay away from there, but I'd go in on slack tide, just kind of plan my dives properly. And I just noticed this crazy amount of life. Like it's, it's just completely vibrant and colorful and beautiful. And um, yeah, I got this, this amazing, image and I, I actually submitted this to um, uh, Canada Geographic for a competition and I, I recently just won and I was in the category for uh, urban wildlife so it was pretty pretty well fitted for that but just shows you like you know I didn't really enhance the, the blue color of the ocean here this is like a really good visibility day um, in the winter and um, on Vancouver Island and it just goes to show you that 
you know, you, you can find these really cool things all over the world too. Um, this, I, I just wanted to throw this in here too, because just the wildlife in, in BC is, is massive. Like it's, this is pretty small octopus, like considering um, these guys can get up to about 20 feet long here in BC. This is a, this is a small one, but we get these big, big animals that are just so graceful and, and beautiful to, to see. And they're, you know, GPOs are definitely one of our, our highlights here in British Columbia. Got Puget Sound king crabs, absolutely colorful and beautiful and, and they're big. Like, I'd say they're, you know, some of the biggest ones I've seen are just over a foot, foot long or, or maybe a foot and a half. They're pretty cool, pretty vibrant. And then of course the sea lions. Um, this is kind of one of the species that's well, very well known for everyone that thinks about diving in, in British Columbia is the stellar sea lions that we get here. And they're just, they're so interactive. They, they love, you know, coming around and, and hanging out with you. And it's, it's not like you're going to see the sea lions. The sea lions want to see you. It's, they, they interact like nothing I've seen in the water. Um, I've been, you know, doing shark dives all over the world and, uh, I, you know, I find it great. Sharks are cool, but they don't interact with you like sea lions do. These guys are just, they love it. They, they come up to you and they, they, you know, just gently like bite onto you. Like they're feeling you. Um, they have the same skull structure as a grizzly bear yet. They, my, I'd say my, my little puppy bites harder than these guys. Um, they're, they're pretty fun. And, uh, you know, every once in a while they'll pose for a photo with you. This is by my, my buddy, Steve Woods. And here's me with a, a female stellar sea lion and she's just, just chilling and wanted to be in the picture. It's pretty, pretty wild. There's Steve Woods. He's trying to take a picture, but these things just love to interact so much with you. And they're, they're like, when you, when you're down there with them, they just swarm you. And it's, it's, it can be tough to take a picture of them because they actually get so close to your lens and, and you just get like a sea lion eclipse. And that's just, uh, you know, so, enjoy so enjoyable to be in the water with these guys. And yeah, that's, uh, that's what I got for you guys. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed. Um, let me know if you've got any questions or anything like that. And I hope that uh, everyone gets the chance to explore Canada and, and British Columbia in particular for all the wild diving that we, we have available here. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for that. That's an incredible presentation. I love seeing things like this. It's like, you know, very uh, different than what we're used to. You know what I mean? And I've been telling you for I don't know how many months now that I keep saying that I need to get up there and dive with you sometime soon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jay. The, the tadpoles, that was beautiful. It was incredible. That, that's something I would love to see. We were doing some hiking in Palau um, a few months back, and we came across these little ponds just filled with them. I was like, I wish I had my underwater housing together. And it was just incredible watching them move and how they all move together and everything. Like, Yeah, and I mean, all you need is about six inches of water, and you can still stick your camera down there to get a photo. Exactly, yeah. That's what I love about underwater photography. You, you can do it anywhere. Uh, it's inspiring to, to see it because we normally think of it in such a way of like, you know, pretty coral reefs or big sharks and these kind of things. It's great to see, you know, it, it's inspiring to see like a completely different way of doing it and different things you can find and all that kind of stuff. So thank you for that, man. Yeah. So guys, we'll open up the questions. Um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You can click on that and type in your question and uh, we'll read them out to uh, Maxwell to get some answers for you. So let's see, let's get started. First question I got for you is from Morgan. It says, fantastic photos, thank you for sharing. Do you take people with you diving or would you in the future? I'm excited to explore some Minnesota rivers and lakes with the new lens. Uh, hey, thanks Morgan for the, the question. Um, I do do uh, private guides once in a while for, for people. I try not to you know, post these locations online just because I don't want to get flooded with, with tourists and whatnot, but for, for you know, one-on-one -on -one experiences with people I, I do. And um, I mean, there's, there's rivers and lakes everywhere. There's just so many places to explore. I, you know, I bet there's some really clear rivers right in your, your own backyard. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you ever want to contact me and get in touch for diving in, in BC, just, just let me know. Awesome. Where should they contact you for that? Hit you up on Instagram or Facebook or email? Yeah, Instagram or my website. Um, it's maxwellhone.com and it's just uh, Maxwell with one L. And then I'm going to type it into the group real quick for you. Awesome. And then dot I'm also com, you said, right? Yeah, dot com. Yeah. Perfect. All right, guys, just put the link in the chat for everybody. Awesome. 
I'm going to have to take you up on that one-on-one -on -one offer soon. <laughs> as soon as this is over, I'm coming up there, but I got to fix my dry suit first. It's a little bit colder than Cabo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The water temperature is pretty, pretty freezing here, but it's, it's well worth it. Yeah, it looks like it. So Sue says, uh, amazing stories and images. You mentioned that the salmon, tadpoles, and other animals don't mind divers as long as you give them time to get used to you. Do you worry that if these experiences get more known or commercialized, that this might change and there would be a negative impact on the wildlife? Uh, I mean, there could be. Uh, for the salmon, uh, particularly the, the places I, I go, um, there, there's quite often there's other snorkelers there that are, are checking out the salmon. Throughout the years that I've seen it, I've, I haven't witnessed any kind of changes or behavior issues or anything like that. I mean, the tadpoles kind of uh, just do their thing and you know, I, I kind of go th there throughout the season and, and watch them and, you know, they're, they're doing fine. Like there's never any issues with, you know, them, them getting hurt or, or anything like that. So yeah, I haven't seen any problems and um, I wouldn't commercialize it, you know, I wouldn't, uh, you know, bring a group into the lily pads mm -hmm. because that's, that's how you, you destroy the environment. Uh, Cause it's so, it's so delicate. So yeah, I, I think it's kind of a special occasion for like one or two people to kind of do, but not, not tours and stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we had, I met a, one of our guests, um, Ace, was out here in the autumn and he was talking about he was on a project with Sony up to shoot the salmon and he was telling us how like it's insanely regulated, like you would not expect it because it's kind of like in the middle of nowhere, but he was saying like the entire time that he was in the water, he was only allowed to be in the water a certain amount of time a, a day in this river and everything. And the whole time they would have a park ranger basically standing over his back, you know what I mean? Like making sure that he's not doing anything to harass them or do anything bad or anything like that. So that's pretty amazing because yeah, when I think of it is like, you think of these rivers in the middle of nowhere, but they're actually still protecting it and working to protect it, which is really great. Yeah, no, that's good. There, there are lots of rivers like that around here where they're, they're quite heavily protected, especially mm -hmm. like certain species of salmon. You know, like you get the, the sockeye, they only run every three years or so here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of the, the, the rivers are regulated with, with, um, with different rules and regulations and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I try to find spot, spots that are off the grid that are, aren't people don't really know about. And yeah. <laughs> I don't uh, publicize them to, to try and get people to go there. Exactly. Awesome. Great question, Sue. So Liz says, uh, your photos are amazing. What is your typical, typical camera setup, uh, camera, lens, strobes? Okay. Uh, thanks. I, I appreciate that. Um, my camera is a Panasonic GH5. Um, I use it with a Olympus 8mm fisheye. That's kind of my go-to setup because it's just, it's nice and light, portable, micro four thirds, and get, it gets like really amazing video quality. And that's usually the camera I use for licensing uh, video clips and things like that. But in the future, I'd like to get a red camera. I just uh, I don't like break the bank and I can't really afford that <laughs> right now. But hopefully um, there are some projects coming up in the future for me that I might be able to, to use one, just use one of the rental red cameras to, to get out filming. And yeah, I mean, the Panasonic GH5 is awesome. It's, that's what I use for all those photos in, in my slideshow. And it does a good job. I mean, it's not the best but it, it, it i like having the versatility of using um having a camera for both photography and videography yeah. and um for lights when i use lights i've pretty much i've only used um video lights for the last three years um i'm actually an ambassador with light motion i've been using the product for the last 10 years and yeah that's it's typically what i use is just just uh two two uh, video lights and it, it gets the job done and i haven't had need for strobes and haven't used them in the last three years i've just been sitting on my shelf collecting dust actually that's awesome uh, gh5 is a phenomenal camera i was actually looking at trying to buy one the other day um trying to get one because i really want to start to shoot more video and I, I there's like nothing like it on the market when it comes to video and everything such an incredible camera mm -hmm. All right, so Maggie Dillon says, amazing photos. What is your Instagram? I can send you the link. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's just uh, Maxwell Hone. Nice, quick, and easy. There's only one of me in the world. <laughs> there we go. I'll throw it in the, the group too. Perfect. Awesome. All right, Christine asks, your photography and video is just stunning and the colors are so vibrant. Do you prefer freshwater over um, versus saltwater photography? And is there a difference of the challenges that you face in say one or the other? You know, I, I, I love them both uh, equally. Um, we're really fortunate here on Vancouver Island to have 
really cool, unique, different um, seasonal dives. So when I'm diving in the winter, I'm, I'm usually diving in the ocean um, because the ocean here in, in the winter is very clear and it's nice and crisp. You don't have the algae and plankton blooms. And then during the summer months, I'm, I'm diving in the, the rivers and lakes and the canyons and, and whatnot. Um, the one thing I do love about diving freshwater is you don't have to rinse your gear and <laughs> there's, like it's 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 great like I, you know I can throw my all my dive equipment into my car and go out to the up the logging roads go for a dive and then just unpack and I don't have to do anything with uh, rinsing which is which is pretty handy uh, as far as like colors go and, and things like that um, I find I, I really like you know diving in the ocean to get that nice vibrant you know colors there's just so much life especially around here and then for more like moody and like uh, utilizing the sun rays and, and, and getting kind of unique perspectives, I, I like to do the, the freshwater sites around here. Awesome. Sounds great. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. When I first started diving, it was in the UK and I used to do a lot of quarry diving and these kind of things. Um, so you get some really cool stuff, really cool critters too, and just a very different experience, I think, than the ocean in general. It's a really, really incredible. Mm. Awesome. Anyone else have any other questions or anything like that? Looks like we're caught up on those. If anybody has any other questions, you can pop them in, in the file hold up for a sec. And then um, if not, tomorrow we're back at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time with Christina Cortez, one of the founders of Coral Hero. Um, she's gonna be talking about uh, their conservation work and the kind of adventure they've had designing this whole uh, reef restoration program in the Mexican Caribbean and these kind of things. So really looking forward to that. And then the following day, you've got Ellen coming on to talk about the, an intro to coral reefs and kind of introduce people to a quick intro. It's a really good one for the kids too. Um, you can get the little mini ninjas involved and all that. Make sure to check out the Coral Reef Conservation course on Saturday too, if you're interested in learning a bit more and taking that uh, much deeper. It's about a two, three hour course, um, all done online, kind of similar to how we do Ocean Stories, but with multiple people involved. Um, cool, so we've got one more question and uh, from Sue A. She says, any hints or tips on how we can find our own off the grid spots to explore? Uh, Google Maps. I just, uh, I spend so much time like looking at the satellite imagery from above and just kind of getting a, a bird's eye view of, of different different spots and you know I just uh, spend lots of time in my car driving around and you know going up logging roads probably taking places taking my car places I shouldn't be but uh, it's it's well worth it and I you know I uh, just get out and explore and I, usually it's a lot of like scout scout trips so I'll, I'll go out and just kind of scout around and see what might be available and I'm kind of lucky here because I'm like I'm basically living in the wilderness and I'm pretty close to all the rivers and stuff so you know, I'd say look at satellite Earth and um, uh, look for, you know, just really cool spots that, that might work for photography and just, just get out exploring. Awesome. Sounds great. I, the satellite imagery is great. And we use it. I use it a lot for stuff here, too. It's a great free resource. Um, Max also asks, uh, is it immaculate shots? As always, uh, would you consider the ocean diving there more advanced or are there spots for beginner divers as well? Um, there are spots for beginner divers as well. Um, it, it is quite advanced, like it, as far as like Discovery Passage, just because it's really strong currents. And I mean, if you're not comfortable or haven't been diving in a dry suit before, it, it's kind of it becomes a bit challenging. So you just want to first get comfortable with the dry suit diving, get comfortable, you know, being in cold water, and then it's just kind of a baby steps from there but I mean there's so many shore dive sites in this area which is which is pretty cool you can just drive up to the shore and hop in for a dive and yeah see all these cool critters but um yeah I, I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't jump in in the discovery passage right away with the, with the currents and I'd, I'd kind of get used to the shore dives first that's awesome awesome well thank you very much man thanks for all the, the sharing your time with us and everything like that today um, thank you for everybody that stopped in and checked it out and all that. We'll see you guys tomorrow and everything. Um, Max, is, Maxwell has been awesome. Thank you so much again. And Thanks, uh, we'll be, see you soon. Take yeah. care of that and hopefully see you in Canada once this is all over. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Jay. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a great day.